Hey folks, I know most of you have already seen my IBMA video, but if you haven't checked it out, please go watch it. It was crazy meeting so many of you there. I feel like I talked to hundreds of people. And a lot of you had seen the video where I said I was going to be giving away t-shirts, and I ran out of all of them in like the first two days. I can't wait to see more of you next year, but until then, we're hanging out right here, back, back home. Today we're looking at a Tony Rice composition, Swing 51. There's two different sources that you might know this tune from. There's the David Grisman Quintet or the Tony Rice album, Acoustics. If you're a real super fan, you may have seen the intro and you already know that I'm going to be doing the David Grisman Quintet break. And one of the reasons for that is I already know that there is a published version of the Acoustics break. My friend Mickey Abraham, he actually showed it to me after I did my transcription because I sent it to him to be like, hey, is this right? And honestly, they're pretty similar anyway, so who cares? Remember, you can always get all of the tabs from my YouTube channel at LessonsWithMarcel.com in the tab store, and most of them are free. Anyway, if you've seen the How to Play series before, you know the drill. We're going to look at some techniques, pentatonic shapes, etc. So we understand what Tony's thinking, and then we're going to do uh, sort of a play-by-play -play breakdown of the entire break. Uh, so when you see me play the break with the tab at the very end, everything makes sense and you know what's going on. All right, so Tony Rice is playing in a very pentatonic way in this break, but most of the time, the scales that he's using aren't really lining up with the chords that are happening in the rhythm part. So let's look at an example. In this tune, Tony uses a C major pentatonic scale over a D minor 9 chord and an F major 7 chord. Why would Tony do that? Well, he's pointing out some extended harmony, and sometimes it makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't. So let's look at the notes. A D minor 9 chord contains D, F, A, C, and E in it. And a C major pentatonic scale contains C, D, E, G, and A in it. Some of these notes make sense. Tony's got the root note of the chord in his scale, D, as well as the extended harmonies, C and E, which are the minor 7th and 9th respectively. He also has the 5th of the chord, A. But his scale doesn't include the 3rd. Instead, it contains the 11th, G, which, if used correctly, could sound pretty hip, potentially. You can think of this as like a little trick to get upper chord extensions into your playing, without having to think too much. So let's go through the ones that Tony uses. For instance, here's a D major pentatonic for D major 9 and G13. Next, we have that C major pentatonic for the D minor 9 chord in the F major 7, like we discussed a second ago. And lastly, an E major pentatonic scale that Tony uses over C sharp minor 7, F sharp 7, E9, and D major 9. I do want to point out a little problem with Tony's trick, though. That the danger is when you imply the wrong upper extensions with your chosen pentatonic scale. For instance, in the chords, we have a G13, and Tony plays a D major pentatonic over it. Now, a G13 chord would have an F natural in it, while the D major pentatonic would have an F sharp in it. This particular note, the Fs, are the difference between a G major 7 chord and a G7 chord or a G13 chord, right? So that's bad. Those are two very different chords that do two very different things. The only reason it doesn't really sound terrible in this tune is because the G13 doesn't really functionally make sense. And that's actually probably another thing we should talk about. So Tony has a couple big unresolved 2-5-1s in this arrangement. Basic jazz harmony kind of has this uh, point to resolutions and chord changes uh, in these classic ways. Tony's just missing a couple big opportunities to make the chords make more sense, I guess you could say. So one could be this line where D minor 9 moves to G13, forming the 2 and the 5, but the next measure doesn't have a C major 7, which would normally be the 1 chord in that short 2-5-1. I might have put a C major 7 chord there. But if you continue on that same line, we actually get another one. So you get F major 7 going to B flat 9, which forms another sort of 2-5 movement, but we 
don't get a one still. Instead, we land on D major nine, which doesn't make any sense. To fix this, you could put like an E flat nine or an E flat seven right there, and you would get a tritone sub leading into D major nine, whatever. It, it honestly doesn't really matter because the song still sounds good, but it's something to think about, right? Tony is sort of doing an impression of jazz right now. There's a lot of evidence that he's making mistakes. It's a little clumsy. The music is good, but this is why it's not jazz. And this is why Tony always says, I'm not a jazz guitar player. I should also make it really clear that I, I'm not complaining or anything. I'm not trying to rip on Tony. <laughs> These choices are just a little non-functional or non-traditional. I love the tune. They're just not what you would traditionally expect in situations like that. So let's listen to the guitar break demo again. Listen for all the things that we just talked about. Make sure you can hear them, and then we'll move on to the breakdown. Alright, so with all that nerd stuff out of the way, let's break this tune down. So in this first measure, we already have some of the things that we're talking about. This first line is very pentatonic sounding. He's actually including the major seventh, that's what that ninth fret note is. We're playing over this D major nine chord, which has the major seventh and the ninth as the implies. So that line makes sense, right? This is a D major or B minor pentatonic line going over a D major chord, relative major and minor, all of that stuff hopefully makes sense to you. Continuing. All of that makes sense too. This is right within our D major pentatonic lines. I'm not worried about any of this. The first interesting sort of weird moment we get is over this D minor nine chord. This is where Tony starts doing the thing. He's playing more of a C major pentatonic line over a D minor nine chord and he gets an interesting sound. You can see in the tab I've written that open G string and I put it in parentheses. I don't think Tony means to play it, but of course you can hear it in the recording just very gently. So I decided I'd put it in the tab anyway. Continuing past the D minor 9 chord, we have this line over the G13 chord. And this is what I talked about normally over a G13 chord or a G7 chord, if we're thinking about slightly simpler harmony, normally we wouldn't want to play that major 7 note. It just kind of implies the wrong quality over the chord. It doesn't really give us the seven sound like the chord is going somewhere, like there's a resolution coming. But we also know that, hey, the harmony in this tune isn't incredibly functional in this moment. So we don't have to worry about it too much. It kind of plays, it kind of works out. Um, because Tony doesn't end up using the G13 sound to go to like a C major seven, even though he could have. Continuing, we get this uh, F major seven chord coming up and Tony plays C major pentatonic over it. And when you're watching the chords change and you're reading these lines, you can really see Tony's brain just like picking the next pentatonic scale. His statements are very clear. Sometimes they're, you know, they're almost particularly short because He's got to move to the next scale when the chord changes. By the way, you can see in that B flat nine chord, Tony just totally ignores it. He just keeps playing this A minor, C major pentatonic. Uh, over the next D major nine chord, Tony's playing kind of an E major pentatonic. Which works out. Um, it works out because it's hinting at all kinds of interesting qualities, very right? interesting extensions of the chord. But uh, you can kind of see how Tony got to that point, why he made that decision. You look at this chord, and Tony could have seen this arpeggio, which even though this note's right not in our chord shape, still works out. Tony could have thought of that, and then he could have matched it up with this pentatonic shape. This is all sort of logical thinking that he's doing. He's coming to these conclusions about which scales could work over the chords, and most of the time they work out great, which is very interesting. We of course know about Tony, he doesn't talk a lot of theory, he doesn't want to, 
And uh, so it's actually very interesting to us that all of these lines work out so well the way that they do. Continuing, right, we have D minor 9 again. Once again, Tony is thinking uh, C major pentatonic. This is the same lines we've seen before, G13, similar again. See that I've written the pick strokes in this tab. There's lots of moments where you get a bunch of offbeat notes in a row. So look at all of those upstrokes and make sure you're putting them all in the right places. I'm sure in my performance, I even messed some of them up. When we finally get to this A7 chord, I even messed up with the pick strokes just now, right after I said it. Tony's singing about an A major pentatonic. He's singing about this kind of guy. So he's not always making these weird choices or these weird connections. Sometimes he's doing more of the obvious choice, more of the expected choice, and it, it works out great over this A7 chord. After that, we have this. You can play that a lot of different ways with your right hand. Um, however you want to think about it is up to you. I think that double stop should probably be hybrid picked. You probably want to grab that uh, high E string with your ring finger, and that will make you have a better day, I promise. It's a little easier to get that out. And it's not going to sound the same if you just strum those two notes. That's how Tony gets one of the notes to really sound like it's popping. And it's a really interesting, distinct sound. This line where he's playing over B minor 7, he's playing over C major 7. Kind of makes sense intuitively. He's thinking about a D chord over the B minor 7, which makes sense. B minor 7. D, very similar chords, the relative major and minor. Playing the pentatonic scale just is an obvious choice to make. Over the C major 7 chord, he's actually not playing a C major pentatonic after all of the C major pentatonic that he's played. He's playing more of a C major scale. It's kind of hard to hear in the recording, gets a little boomy down there. Can't really tell exactly what he's doing, but he's definitely doing something like this. Something like that which would really just be a C major scale, right? We have all the pentatonic notes plus, oh, what, the major seventh, we have the perfect fourth in there. We also have, yeah, we got a chromatic passage that includes the dominant seven. So yeah, he's got all of the sort of things we expect in C major and some extensions too. Uh, as we move on, this is the big passage where uh, Tony sticks, uh, for the most part, he sticks with E major because it makes sense over all these chords. C sharp minor seven could be a two. F sharp seven would be the five. Sometimes you can just treat those kind of as the same chord. So over the C sharp minor seven, he's thinking about E, once again, relative major and minor, E major, C sharp minor, right? He's thinking about the pentatonic scale that goes with both of those. Yeah, he can play that and it'll kind of work over the F sharp seven too. It's not really a problem. Um, Um, this quick slide that he does actually points out a note in the F-sharp 7 chord, which I thought was really hip, really cool. It shows that um, Tony's making smart choices. He does know what the chords are. This isn't just random guessing. When he gets over the B minor 7 chord, he also makes a smart choice. He plays this in arpeggio. And when it goes to the E9 chord, he slides back up and gives us some of an E chord really is thinking about the chord progressions, but in a way that we normally don't see. Normally, Tony's making obvious choices, this major pentatonic with the matching chord, etc. In this song, he doesn't do that. Continuing A7, it matches with the A major pentatonic scale that we would expect. This um, is a cool move. Um, I think there's an A7 4 there explains the last move you made, the ending triplets. It's a note in an A chord. It's a cool way to end it. It all makes sense. All right, good work, everyone. It's finally time for what you all came for. <laughs> Let's look at the break with the tab in real time. Now that everything makes sense, think about those pentatonic boxes. Think about the harmony. Think about all of the weird things that Tony's doing. You can practice along to it, you can play along to it. Remember, if you click on the settings wheel, that you can lower the speed of this video to 0 0.5, 0 0.75, whatever is a reasonable tempo for you to play along to it at.
Awesome. Thanks for hanging out. If you like taking a lesson from the biggest, baddest billy goat in the barnyard, please like this video or leave me a comment down below. If you really like the video, you can subscribe to this channel. All of those things help these videos do better on YouTube because it lets YouTube know that people like the videos, people are watching them, people enjoy the content. I appreciate all of that. If you do want to support me in some other way to keep this channel going, you can check out my website, Lessons with Marcel. We have a lot of blog posts there. We do those every week. We also have uh, the licks from Jazz and Grass. We're on a small hiatus, but we'll be back soon. Of course, there's everything in the tab store where you can get the tab for this video and all kinds of other tabs and fiddle tune arrangements. We have merch there. We have t-shirts. I'm not wearing one today. Um, we also have Skype lessons. You can sign up for Skype lessons there, which is awesome. If you want to take a lesson with me, please sign up now because once again, there is a wait list forming. So great. I'll see you all in a week. Midnight train spelled her blood.